now's uh, we're on cue, I believe, Joe. Yes, so feel free um, to take the show away. OK, yeah, we'll make a start. So today we're going to be looking at um, how you can start to get set up um, for success with project service automation. So in terms of the broad agenda, then we're going to first of all touch upon some of the key challenges that typically you may find when you're adopting PSA for the first time. We'll look at what would, um, how we can sort of get around that and sort of set the scene in terms of what the objectives are for this session. We're basically just going to go through and show you all in a very sort of logical order in terms of all the things that you need to think about when setting up your PSA environment for the first time. So whether it's your invoice frequencies, your time units, product catalog, we're going to go through in, in sort of detail and discuss, OK, um, you know, what are they used for, how you set them up most importantly. Uh, so hopefully by the end of the session, if you're following things through, uh, you can understand what you need to do, because often, um, you know, it can be quite difficult uh, to figure things out when you go into the system for the first time. And then we'll close things off, hopefully have some time for Q&A at the end. We'll also uh, give some recommendation in terms of things that, OK, you've done all this. Great. What do I need to do next to actually start using the system in a bit more detail? So yeah, we touched upon this already. So uh, I've um, run a small um, Microsoft Gold Partner um, consultancy practice based in the UK. Um, as you can see, I've got way too many uh, shiny badges there. Um, they're quite nice to collect, actually. So I think that's probably makes up for it. Um, so in terms of my background and experience, I've been working with um, Dynamic CRM and 365 uh, for about five years. Um, so previously, my background is probably more on the technical side of things. So working with uh, things such as SQL, SQL Server, C Sharp, Office 365, uh, as I mentioned already, doing a lot with Azure these days and, you know, and things across the whole power platform. Um, you know, so keeping um, it's, it's an interesting time to be working with these tools. Uh, there's a lot. There's a lot to learn, a lot to get stuck in, which is really great. Um, for my sins, I'm also a uh, Prince2 project manager practitioner, so that maybe explains a little bit why I'm quite fond of PSA and things like that. Uh, also Scrum Master. Also involved as well as part of the official user group for Dynamics, uh, uh, specifically the Northwest chapter. Uh, we're hoping to have our next virtual meeting at the end of July, uh, so keep uh, keep an eye out for that. And we'd love to have you along uh, if you're around and available. Okay, so when we think about PSA, project service automation, for the first time, I think you know it can be argued that it is a, a good system. You know, and if you're using it correctly, it can be a really effective solution for, you know, for managing your project delivery across multiple work streams. But, you know, that's not to say that it's all, you know, all roses. Um, you know, there are some issues. We touched upon a few of these already. Certainly my experience when it comes to the documentation side of the system, uh, it's generally quite um, inconsistent. So you have pointers to older versions of the um you know of the product version two which isn't basically correct with what's actually now happening in version three um we've touched upon in terms of the development roadmap you know argue you could potentially you know arguing on the other side of it okay well why do you want to invest in psa at the moment if things are going to be changing uh, as we've discussed already you know there is going to be a roadmap to get you moved across to the new version so you know why not you know if microsoft's going to help you in that journey then you know potentially any concerns around where PSA is going as a product, you know, can potentially just be discarded, you know, and also as well with Project for the Web as well, you know, so um, there's been some sessions already today, I believe, on Project for the Web. Uh, if you're looking underneath the hood of that, it's using a lot of the core functionality of PSA, you know, and it's a very great product in of itself, but then there's questions in terms of how that sits within PSA, you know, and arguably you could also say that if you, if you are currently using PSA and want to transition across to using Project for the Web, it's going to be impossible because of how it's handling data behind the scenes. So when it comes down to it, I think when I'm looking at PSA deployments for the first time, when I'm speaking to clients and trying to get them equipped for success when it comes to PSA, it's really just about understanding what the process is. How do I get things set up from start to finish? How do I get my environment ready to go for success so that I'm not missing anything? You know, I've not, I've not, you know, I'm not in a situation where I've not created a record and therefore wondering why my costs aren't filtering through correctly. You know, and as a consequence of this, what you may find is as an end result, you know, it's a great system, but you know it's either being poorly implemented, not for any sort of malice potentially, just purely from a lack of okay, I don't understand what's going on here. I don't understand how to set things up, you know. And as with any business system, if it's been poorly implemented, it's going to end up being not utilised. It's going to end up in the bin, and the business just wastes a whole load of money as part of that and time and effort around that, which we don't want at all. So really, what I want to try and address, I want to try and address these 
um, issues as part of today's sessions. I want to try and give you a bit of a guide in terms of, okay, here's, here's a checklist. Here's what you need to do to get going with PSA. We're going to talk through the sort of the core configuration entities that you'll need to work with and set up. Uh, hopefully, as a, as a result of this, we're going to be sharing out the slides and videos. We can give you a bit of a reference point that you can refer back to. We're going to get quite hands on. We're going to be jumping in and out of dynamics as we create the records. We're going to build things out as well. Uh, in terms of things that we're not going to be looking at, uh, sort of out of scope for today, we're not going to be looking in detail around this, the, the sort of detailed sales process, the project delivery or unified resource scheduling side of things. We will touch upon these at the end of them. But in terms of the stuff that we're setting up today, this all feeds into this. Um, so really, you know, you know, so just keep that in mind in terms of um, what we're trying to achieve today. OK, so. You have decided, OK, I want to get stuck in, I, I, you know, PSA is PSA is the system for me. What do I need first of all? We need a, you need a current version of the application first of all. So by current version, I mean version three. If you're spinning up a new uh, project service automation, uh, either sandbox production instance with PSA installed today, it will be version three. If it has been a case that you've got something sticking around maybe from a few years back, you might just need to check it and make sure you transition and upgrade across to version three. Uh, I believe these days it's now uh, an automated process, but if not, you might need to get in touch with support just to help you along. Um, so as you're getting started with anything, the recommendation is set up a sandbox, set up a trial, uh, you know, work through it in an isolated environment. Don't be letting this touch your production environment necessarily until you're happy and sure that this is all working. Uh, and we have got the ability to set up free trials as well. You know, so use that to your leisure, set up a 90 day trial and just experiment further with there. So when it comes to our set requirements then, so we spun up our new instance, we're ready to get going. There's a lot of different configurations that we have to do, various different records that we have to set up, things that we have to enable, depending on what we need to get out of the system. And the broad sort of order is sort of on this slide here. This is what we're going to be going through today. The ones we've got highlighted in italics are sort of purely optional. It really depends in terms of what your organization is doing. So if you're transacting across multiple uh, geographies, across multiple currencies, then yeah, you may need to have multiple currencies. Uh, if you're in a situation where you're offering uh, line item products alongside, you know, services, you know, time and materials type things, then again, the product catalog might be relevant. Uh, but just keep in mind, they're not strict requirements, the ones in italics on here, um, you know, so just discard them. If they're not relevant, just discard them, focus on the things instead that you do need. So the currencies and exchange units then, for those who are familiar with the sales module in Dynamics 365, um, so when you're deploying out your instance for the first time, uh, you have to specify what is your default base currency in the system. Um, for any of additional currencies that you want to start transacting with, uh, either within the sales module or within PSA, you need to go in and install those. The key thing you have to remember with this, though, is that you want to be populating this with your exchange rate values. So that way, from a reporting standpoint, when you're then running things off in your base currency, so let's say as an organization, you um, you transact, your primary transaction value is in pounds sterling, but you're also doing uh, deals in you know, US dollars or euros. You want to make sure that when you're reporting back at the home base in pounds sterling, that things are being exchanged correctly. So make sure, pay some attention to that. You might need to, over time, go in and just update the exchange rate based on fluctuation and things like that. Um, and really what I would say is that when you're starting out for the first time, um, you know, do that analysis and, you know, have some prediction in terms of, OK, you know, maybe not necessarily straight away, but further down the line, what currencies ultimately are you going to be transacting in? And ideally get those installed, um, you know, when you're getting started out. So you're not having to go through a process later on to get them added on. Um, and that's just a recommendation for me, you, you know, feel free to add them on as and when, but just you know, give some thought to it really, uh, and you'll be hopefully in a good stop. So this is one of these things that we have to go into the classic interface to basically get set up. So let's jump into our instance now and get that set up. Um, so if I go down to my browser down here. So I've got basically just a, a very clean PSA instance over here. I've reset this. It's basically just empty. We go into projects. We can see there's absolutely nothing in here. So it basically just gives us a clean slate that we can start to build out. So at the moment for currencies, this is something that we still have to go into the classic interface to set up. So we click on the gear icon at the top up there, go to advanced settings. Then underneath here, we've got our currencies in the business management area. So by default, I've deployed this out with pound sterling as my main currency. So let's go in and just add in a few different currency values and just see how that looks. So uh, we'll add in a uh, the euro, uh, if I can find it on here somewhere. Uh, I think it's under the country name. Uh, yeah, we'll do German as the euro on there. Uh, I'm just going to set a, 
I don't know what the current exchange rate is. Uh, feel free to drop it in the chat if you do know. Um, we'll just save and close that and then we'll also add another one on there. So this is really this is quite straightforward really in terms of what you're doing. So it's just a case of just identifying in terms of OK, here are the countries you want to populate. You know, so maybe I want to do it in also um, you know, Norwegian Krona as well. So again, add that in, set it up like that, save and close. And that's it. You've got your not just your base currency set up in the system, but also the other currencies that we want to eventually transact in as we start to get resources booked out and things like that. OK. So moving on then. Invoice frequency. So when it comes to generating your uh, invoice documents within project service automation, um, now I think the thing to just to mention with invoices more generally in PSA, they're not really sort of designed and built um, you know, to basically spit out invoices that you can then just print off or email out to your customers. Um, you know, really um, you should be using your sort of, you know, accounting system of choice. So whether it's Business Central, F&O, or maybe something else like Sage to do that. So, you know, so the purposes of invoice documents within PSA is just to give you just a pointer in terms of, okay, here's here's what you need to put. Here's the value that you need to then put on your, you know, F&O invoice. Um, so just keep that in mind. They're not really designed to be able to just spit out things that you just hand across to the customers. Uh, but what we can do in PSA is that you can actually define how and when invoice documents are spit out using invoice frequencies. You know, so typically, if you, as an organisation, um, you know, most account department accounts teams or departments will have their own processes in terms of when they want to raise invoices. Some will be, you know, at you know in the afternoon every Thursday they'll raise it. Others might be a little bit more fluid. It might be that you want to have it every week or you know at the end of every month. Let's say what you can do in PSA is specify these frequencies, and then that will then dictate how the invoices get generated out automatically. So you know really nice, a helpful feature just to get things automated and to help us along, which is really great. So to do that, what we would do is we set up within the settings area of the application our invoice frequencies, uh, and we've got a few options there that we can specify as part of that. So uh, in this example on here on the screenshot, we can see we want to have it monthly. So uh, one day per month, we want to run that. Uh, and in this particular case, we said, okay, the first calendar day of the month is when we want to generate an invoice each month. Uh, as, an, addition, as a, an alternative option, what you could also do instead is you could have it so that let's say on the first Friday of every week instead, or the second Friday, or yeah, first Friday, the name's wrong on there. Um, first Friday every month, I want to spit out an invoice instead. And again, you've got some more options there, first, second, third, fourth, depending on what you need to do. So let's get that set up now in our PSA environment, see how it looks. So get rid of classic for now. We don't really want to be using that as, as much as we can avoid it. We're gonna go down into settings. Click on invoice frequencies. We don't get any any default invoice frequencies to provided for us in PSA. It's something that we have to actively go in and set up. So let's just get that done now. So for this one, then we're going to do something. Let's do something a little bit um, strange and freaky. Why not? So we'll do a bi-weekly uh, invoicing frequency for this. We we'll just give it a name value, specify our period, save that in there. And at this point, um, it's you can then go into so this subgrid on here is enabled after you save the record, and through here you can either customize the default record that's created for you by double clicking into it. Um, so I could sort of say, okay, I want to have it so it's maybe the second Wednesday of each month instead. Save and close that. So that's all fine. If I want to work with multiple invoice frequencies, then that's something that PSA also supports. So again, we can do something maybe just a little bit different here. We want to do um, a day of a period, let's say. Um, let's do it day of a period. We want to say maybe four runs per month. Um, so day of period example. So again, there's nothing there at the moment until we save the record. PSA then goes off and creates the appropriate records for us. And then again, we can just go in and just sort of tinker about with that. So maybe just sort of say this, I want this to be 12 instead. Um, maybe change this over to um, to one and you can see the forms adjusting based on what we've populated on here which is really quite helpful okay so that's invoice frequencies so hopefully hopefully fairly okay so far it's not nothing too difficult if this is just simple creating it and configuration of records in the system you know so not not just hopefully a uh, uh, too difficult for anybody to do really so next then, so we defined our invoice frequencies. Now we need to give some consideration in terms of, okay, what's when it comes to uh, 
you know, additional transactions that we want to potentially expense, we need to start thinking about setting those up, the different categories in the system. You know, so, so potentially as part of, let's say, a potential project, it might be that, you know, our resources need to go out onto, onto site. Um, you know, we want to therefore factor in the ability to charge mileage, uh, maybe even overnight hotel costs, meals and things like that. So transaction categories gives us the framework to start thinking about this. And now a key consideration as part of this when you're setting these up is your bidding type values. These will ultimately start to dictate in terms of when you're recording, um, you know, expenses, you know, that match back to these categories, whether or not they get factored in as part of your various um, figures that get generated out. So you've got four options on there. So generally you would choose either non-chargeable or chargeable. Complementary are not available are also options as well. And um, we're going to discuss these in a bit more detail um, shortly, but transaction categories can also be associated alongside unit groups and default units as well, which is quite nice. So just setting it up then, so again, it's something that we do in the settings area of the application. We just go in um, and we can just define it. So in this case, we're doing a category for meal. Um, so because we're going to need this a little bit later on for some of our demos, let's just jump in now and get a, uh, a transaction category set up. So by default, we actually do get a default <laughs> transaction category set up in the system for us. Um, this comes shipped out there. We're just going to ignore that one for now. And we're going to go in and just create a couple of transaction categories. So we're just going to select default unit for all of these. We're not really too, too caring about this. So we're going to say that our meals um, are sort of non-chargeable. Uh, it's something that we just sort of suck up as part of, you know, when we do on site, you know, part of our jobs and things like that. So we're just going to click save on that. Um, whereas travel, for example, OK, well, maybe that, that is something that, yeah, I definitely want to be invoicing. You know, if we're having to travel, you know, 100 miles across the country to visit the customer, then, yeah, there needs to be some sort of um, charge relating to that. So, again, we're just going to uh, select chargeable on that. And that, that will then feed through later on as we're setting things up. OK, so that's transaction categories then. So far, so good. So. So with our transaction categories then created, we need to start thinking about our expense categories. Um, so these are what effectively people will start to select in the system when they're recording their expense values for the first time. As we mentioned already, you need to make sure you've associated these to an existing transaction category in the system, which is why we set those up first. Um, as part of this, you can also dictate whether or not a receipt is required when the individual is submitting the expense. Um, I would have thought in most situations, uh, most companies I've worked with, I've never worked in a company where they've not asked for expenses for, for receipts as part of expenses. Uh, if you have worked in a company that hasn't asked for that, please do respond in the chat because I would generally want to join that company because I think you'd be able to get away with murder quite clearly. Um, so yeah, so generally just always just enable that because you know it's going to be it's going to always be required. And then also, um, what Microsoft do actually advise is when you for a new deployment. Um, they recommend that you set up the following expense categories as default. This is just a guide, really. Again, just cater it to what you need in the system. You don't necessarily have to record that. But again, th that I thought I just mentioned that specific recommendation around that. So again, expense categories is in our settings area of the application. Again, just another record that we create. and We just go into the system now and get that created. So jump down to expense categories down here. So in this example, I'm just going to create an expense category that very generically refers back to the transaction category, sort of on a one to one basis. Typically, you might want to make the transaction categories a bit more generic at the top level. Uh, but for the purpose of the demo for time today, we're just going to keep them fairly generic. Um, so because I've actually um, set meals as a non chargeable transaction category, it's not something I can actually select on here, because why would you want to expense something which you know can't be then invoice back to the customer potentially just keep that in mind when you're setting up your transaction categories for then for you to then have an appropriate expense category related to that you need to make sure you've, you've checked that field on there so for now we're just going to do travel on this um we're going to um, link this back to one of the ones on here so i'll just sort of say mileage is this one and then again we're going to say mandatory on there um so in fact we'll call this one mileage instead just to keep it fairly uh aligned to that and just for the purposes of this, we will create an additional one without our uh, receipt required. So we'll just call this a uh, car rental. And link this back to our travel category again. Save and close. OK, so we've got some expense categories ready to go in PSA. All good. So moving on then. 
So time units. So when it comes to um, booking resources out on your projects, um, you have to specify as part of that in terms of okay, you know, what, how are they working in terms of their um, number of hours? Is it, is it, are they working, you know, based on number of hours? Is it based on the day or things like that? Um, so by default, when you set up PSA for the first time, it goes into the system and it creates some default time unit categories for both hours and days. Um, what you can look at doing, so maybe you're in a situation, let's say, where you, you, you know, you're doing work based on, let's say, half days, quarter days. Uh, you're doing it in maybe blocks of multiple days for example what you can go in and do it is add on additional time units to suit your requirements and this is just a case just creating the appropriate records underneath the uh, the unit groups that ship by default um, in the application so we're going to jump through this now i'll just skip through these slides fairly quickly because we'll jump into the system now but this is again something that you have to go into the classic interface to set up um, couple of steps that you need to do is, as involved as part of that so let's just go in now and we'll, we'll set up a few time units um, we'll assume that let's say for our particular organization we want to do things based on maybe half days or quarter days potentially so again we go into our advanced settings at the top up here uh, we're going to want to go into our product catalog and then unit groups down here so we can see we've got our time unit group here which has been set up for us already by PSA It loads up the classic form by default. So what you have to do is actually click on this little button up here. It pops out into a new tab and then as if by magic, you're in the unified interface. Wow, that's pretty good. Um, and underneath there, we just click on related. We can get the units tab down here. And then we can see that by default, we've got our specified as our sort of unit on there. So let's just add on an additional one. Uh, we'll call, let's say, day, let's say. Um, we're going to give this a quantity of eight and it's going to derive from our base unit of an hour save and close that and then we'll also do let's say uh, half days so we'll call this one half days and we'll say half days is four and it's based again off our hourly unit on there so again this might be something again it depends on how your organization is booking people out uh, but just give some consideration in terms of um, in terms of how you do that and make sure that you've got your time time units um, you know mirrored accordingly for that okay so this is the one of the optional features when it comes to PSA. So um, if you've spent any amount of time working with the sales module, you'll be familiar with how the product catalog works. You know, so when you're generating your opportunity and your quote lines, you can add on your various products that you want to sell. The application goes off, calculates that out for you, does all that good stuff for you. So the great thing about PSA is that we can actually use that. We can actually use not only resource pricing, but also uh, in fully incorporate our product catalog as well. As part of our um, as part of our system, so a really good ex example and use case of this, you know. So so in our case, you know, we're we're a Microsoft partner, um, you know. So we do consultancy, we do services, um, you know, day rate stuff as well. Uh, but we also sell licenses. You know, we're CSP, we resell licenses from Microsoft. So therefore, having a product catalog, um, you know, that has all the various licenses that we wish to sell, uh, is going to be quite useful. So by adding that onto it, we can not only um, when we're generating our um, you know, opportunities and quotes, we can mix and match that. Uh, it is an optional requirement though, so only really use it uh, if you need it and it's going to be useful for you. Um, and in terms of as a discussion in of itself, it's probably outside the scope of today's session. So instead, I'm going to rely on this, um, this, I think this diagram has been around for about maybe 10, 15 years, I think. Uh, it's still absolutely relevant in terms of describing what the process is for setting up the product catalogue. Um, so this, you know, follow this through. If you are, if it's something that you want to do, this will help get things set up for you, and then you can sort of go through from there. Okay, so now we can actually start getting into the sort of the, arguably the sort of the, the central component, the cornerstone of PSA, our, our resources, our, you know, our individuals, our pieces of equipment, our external organizations, whoever it or whoever or whatever it may be, the things that help deliver our projects. Now, it's not just a case of just going in and just import, you know, necessarily importing a list of, you know, you know, of John, Mary, uh, you know, Jonas or whoever into the system and then boom, you're ready to go. There are actually a few different steps involved uh, to get things set up. So we're actually going to we're going to go through now the order is sort of defined here on the slide. Uh, but let's go through and see what we need to do to get all of the appropriate scaffolding set up for our resources. So characteristics then. So this in a nutshell is just, you know, either your skills or your certifications you know so for example so for myself you know you could say that maybe you know, i've got a skill as c sharp as beginner 
yeah, yeah, I'm a poser coder. So yeah, I'll, um, so I'd, I'd have that as my skill. Whereas for certification, um, you know, so for example, MB600, MB400, I could have those on as, as well. Um, as part of that, you can provide a description. Certification could also be, let's say, a degree or professional accreditation, whatever it may be. And again, you just define as many of these as you need um, you know, for your potential resources that you're booking out. So in this, for, for this particular regard, we actually go into resources rather counterintuitively. We have to click onto skills as opposed to characteristics. There is a little bit like this at the moment where some of the terms don't quite map up. So just, just keep your eye out for that. So go into skills, create that, and then boom, you're away on that. Next of all, we have our rating model. So this is perhaps more relevant for skills as opposed to certifications. So this is where you sort of define on a sort of on a range basis in terms of how proficient a you know, particular sk skill or multiple sk skills are in the application. So, for example, as I said already, you know, in my case, C sharp could be beginner, could be intermediate, could be expert, could be you know god tier, you know wh whatever you wh whatever you think is most. Uh, relevant for your particular organization. So the key thing to remember with your rating models is that you can only have one of these records that have a value of skill in the application. So effectively just one rating model across your skills. Just keep that in mind. And then when you're setting up your skill for the first time, um, so your rating model for the first time, uh, you then have to go in and give a few additional details, such as the name and also define whether it's the default one to use across the organization or not. Now, for rating models, you could also use them alongside your certifications as well. So a good example could be for a degree if you've got, let's say, pass merit distinction. Uh, but generally, you'd want to use them more for skills. Oh, could you just mute your mic, please? Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, OK. So again, rating models, we go in again, the terminology is a little bit sort of uh, not aligned. So it's actually proficiency models you go into. Then from there, you define, set up your minimum maximum rating values and then go in there and then uh, you know, populate the display label for that underneath that. So in this case, we've got, let's say, three values um, of familiar, good, proficient, with good being the default one that we want to use for this. So next, then, we think we need to give some consideration to our bookable resource categories. So these are these are roles, effectively. These are the job roles or the uh, the project roles that we want to use. So whether it's project manager, whether it's software developer, whether it's um, you know engineer, you know, regardless of what it is, you know, there's going to be potentially many different roles that you want to have people booked out for within the application. So billing type makes a reappearance on this. So again, you can define whether or not a resource booked out in a project is something that you ultimately charge into the customer or sort of including as part of your costings. And then when you set them up, you need to give some consideration as well in terms of um, your, you know, how, what your sort of target utilization value is for that resource. Because uh, that has some knock on effects in terms of when you're then looking at the resource calendar, looking at your resource utilization, um, you know, what, you know, red, amber, green, category applies to it so you know the, the details there this is on the slide i think generally you know for most people you don't want to be setting it 100 percent all the time you want to be hopefully giving people some time breathing time for training or for other bau type stuff but again you can just adjust that and again once it's set up it will flow through into the application and adjust how things look later on down the line so again, so you must say, so like with some other stuff in the application, before you can start tagging characteristics to a particular bookable resource category, you need to save the record first. And we'll see how that looks in a few minutes um, when we set things up. So again, we go in there, example on here. So we've got software engineer, target utilization of 75%. Uh, definitely somebody we want to be charging, always charge out for developers because hopefully they can earn us the big books. Um, and then we've got skills down here. So we sort of said that, okay, they're familiar with C sharp, but they're actually a bit more, uh, a bit better when it comes to C++. So hopefully we can charge a bit more for them then. Okay, and then finally, at the end of it, we've got our resources. So these are, um, these are sort of our individuals, our people, our you know, or you know, even assets or external companies, the things that are delivering our projects. Now, in most cases, when you're dealing with sort of individuals as resources, you'll typically want to derive them from either a existing Dynamics 365 user. Uh, if they're not licensed, they're not in the application, then instead you can actually use contact records. That is a viable option. Uh, if you're dealing with external organizations, so maybe you're dealing with a um, you know a third party company that's um, you know helping you um, with a particular project, you can again assign it to an account record. You've also got equipment and facility for sort of non 
what return, I guess, non-physical resources. So where you need to book out a room or let's say a particular piece of equipment, you know, a projector or something like that for your project. You've also got some other resource types as well. You can have generic where it doesn't really fit into any category at all. It's just you just need to have it in there. Crew is for when you've got maybe multiple resources uh, under a common um, descriptor that you want to book out. Now you can also have pools as well. So this is where you can group across multiple different record types, account, contacts, et cetera, again, as one resource that can be booked out. So again, that might be useful if you're dealing with, you know, um, you know, let's say a team of developers, let's say uh, you just want to book it out at a higher level. You're not really too concerned in terms of a detailed level, whether sort of John or Mary are actually booked out specifically on the project. So you set up your resource. At that point, you can then define your skills and roles for them. Um, Great thing about them is that you can use them in PSA as well, in, in sorry, in field service as well. Um, and there's some additional details that you may see on there, which are perhaps more relevant for that instead. What you also need to bear in mind is that a resource needs to be in an organizational unit as well. So just keep that in mind. We're going to look at organizational units a little bit later on. Now, any discussion about resources, we, you know, we, we, we need to touch upon work hour templates. So when you create a resource for the first time, they're going to be assigned um, the organization's default work hour template in the application. So this just basically tells um, tells you when you're booking the resource out, okay, what hours are they working? What days are they working each week? Uh, now, in most cases, you may want to sort of override this, um, you know, so maybe it could be, you know, so for example, with COVID at the moment, maybe, you know, the resources are working more flexible hours just obviously you know make sure that we can obviously keep things ticking over um so what you would typically do in that case is that you would uh, override it at a per resource level uh, or you, again you can do it from the calendar view as well um so this is so they made some changes recently you've now got a really uh, a nice up-to-date sort of pcf control that gives you a nice calendar view where you can go in and specify work hour patterns and things like that so, so typically what you might consider doing is that, OK, so if you've got consistency around your work hour patterns across the board, uh, set what set it up for the first time with one resource, then do a save Canada as then what you can then do is start to use that other resources in the future if you so choose. So again, how, in terms of the resource setting up process, so in this case, we're setting up our good old uh, Alan Steiner test user uh, within there. Uh, we've said that he's got these particular skills on here. We've overridden the target utilization for him at the resource role level. So it's, we're saying here that again, it's 70% that we want to apply on here. And we said that he is a robotics engineer. We could add on additional roles as well. So don't be thinking that, okay, you can just have one role for one person. You know, a role can have many, uh, yeah, per, uh, individual can have many roles tagged to them. And really, you know, as if you're doing software delivery, agile delivery, then yeah, typically that, that it would be a preference for you to have. You want to be having you know multiple skills, multiple role teams uh, to help deliver your projects and get the most value out. Then finally, once the record's saved and ready to go, go to show work hours at the top. And again, we could just set up our uh, particular, um, you know, our working pattern for that resource in there. OK, so let's go in there and let's get to start to get things uh, set up for all that. So first of all, then we need to set up our characteristics. So if we jump across into here, we're going to go to resources down here. Um, so again, it's under skills just to keep things nice and clear. So we'll stick to the software sort of theme and stuff like that. We'll sort of say, let's say, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a uh, C sharp developer, let's say. That's what I want as my sort of skill on there. So I'll just save and close that at that point maybe add on javascript as well because we do a lot with that at the moment uh, with dynamics as well and then let's just say okay i want to have let's say a certification as well so we'll do we'll do our good old uh, mb600 uh, uh, exam as that for instead so you just go in you build all of this out you know individually in terms of everything that you're going to need now at this point, then we want to go in. We want to um, start to modify the um, proficiency models that we've got. We want to align it a bit better for the skills that we set up. Um, so by so when we set up PSA for the first time, we get a default rating model. We can either just disregard this entirely or set up a brand new one from scratch. What we're going to do today is we're actually going to just um, we're going to use it. We're just going to make some small changes to it. What we're going to do is we're going to maybe just increase the rating values for this by one. When I save when I save the record, not save and close, 
um, we can see it's going off behind the scenes and it's creating an additional rating value. Rather frustratingly, it does actually clear down our labels when doing this. Just keep that in mind. Uh, if you are making a change in the future, you might just need to record down that information before you do that. Uh, but let's just go in on here. We're just going to say, um, so our lowest one, we're just going to call a newbie. Uh, for this one, the next one up, we're just going to call, uh, we're just going to say, okay, they're okay. Uh, uh, super proficient. People don't say super enough these days. Save and close. And then number four, we're going to give sort of nice god tier status. Yeah. I want to be a god tier C sharp developer. Uh, okay, so we've got our default rating model ready to go. Um, and we can start to think about maybe using that alongside, um, alongside our skills when we set them up. So now we need to start to give some consideration to our roles. So again, when PSA is set up for the first time, we get two roles by default, project manager and team member. You can use those, take those forward if you want, or maybe just tinker about them as you as you need to. Uh, in this case, we're just going to say, we're just going to create, let's say, two new roles. So we're going to do our Dynamics 365 developer as our first role. Uh, we're going to be super nice to this, to this particular role. We're going to say, OK, target utilization is 50%, uh, and it's definitely something we want to be charging, because I say we want to be earning the big books with, with, these, with these guys. Um, and at this point, then the subgrid becomes enabled. We can start to add on our skills or our competencies. So what we're going to do is we're going to add on C Sharp Developer. We're going to say, OK, we want a super efficient person on there. Uh, and then let's also add on JavaScript as well. So again, it's pulling through the same, um, the same sort of uh, proficiency models across multiple, um, across multiple skills as well, which is quite nice. So that's all done and dusted. Uh, and then we'll get uh, also our Dynamics uh, 365 uh, solution architect, let's say. Uh, we're going to be a bit more meaner to these to these people. We're just going to say we want them basically booked out all the time. And again, we definitely want to charge for them. We've got a little typo on there. Oh, more forms today. OK. So let's add on. Um, so for this one, we're just going to say we just want a certification for this particular one. So we're just going to say MB600 exam. We don't care about proficiency because uh, it is just literally just a pass or a fail for that. That's it. That's all ready to go. So now we can actually go on and start creating our individuals, our, the people who are delivering this. So now we click on resources at the top up here. Again, we get a generic resource deployed out for us. This is where, we, we, where we're not quite sure. A booking in terms of where this is going to be going. This is where the generic resource becomes in use. Uh, we're just going to ignore that for now. We're just going to create a um, um, a generic user. Um, we'll create myself as a resource. Why not? Uh, so it should be there. He is on there. Joe Griffin. Um, again, we're going to be super mean. I'm going to say I want Joe utilized all the time. Give that a save and now we can start to decorate this resource with the things that we've already set up. So, for example, we can sort of say, OK, uh, I want to make sure that they're a C sharp developer. And ideally, they want to be making want to be targeting it as a, you know, as an OK um, proficiency rating for that. And again, we can add in our um, certifications as well. Again, save and close. And as we mentioned earlier, we can tag on multiple resource roles as well if we so choose. So, for example, I can go, uh, OK, I want to say Dynamics 365 developer. That's Joe's default role in this case. Uh, but he but he can also, but because Joe's uh, a versatile individual, um, I'm speaking about the figurative Joe here, not the actual Joe. So just to make that clear, um, he's also a solution architect as well. Um, so at this point, then the resource is ready to go. And now we just need to give some consideration as well to some of these other properties. So, for example, we want to make sure that, OK, Joe is on the display board. We can book him out. He is available for availability search. We may want to change the organization unit. We can just keep it as the default one for now, uh, depending on our needs. Most importantly, at this point, we want to actually dictate what the working hours are. So if we click this button up here, we now get. So previously, this used to go out into the into the old classic interface, the old sort of work hour templates functionality. But now instead we get this beautiful, nice looking PCF grid uh, to basically um, tinker about with. So we can see in this case that we've actually said, that, OK, well, Joe is working for pretty much sort of every single day by the looks of it. Um, 12 a.m. is basically free all the time. 
So again, using this interface, we can start to tinker about with this, change things about. So it might be I want to go, OK, well, I know that Joe's definitely not working on Wednesday. So I'm just going to mark that off. So Wednesday uh, the 16th, I'm just going to say Joe isn't working at all. Click save on there. We can see the time off on there basically changes. Uh, I want to change, let's say, a particular um, working pattern on one day. So I want to say that maybe, OK, on today, um, you know, Joe's only work. Joe's basically doing a half day. So therefore, let's just change that on to, let's say, 12, 12 p.m. Save on that. So it takes a few minutes just to update it. Yeah, it's that one there, it's updated. So typically, the, the best thing to do with this is that there will be some commonality when it comes to working patterns across your, your resources. So do this as a one time action, maybe just um, set things up, you know, based on standard working patterns. And then for situations where you then need to go in and maybe, you know, have time off requests and things like that, just do that as and when it sort of arises. And if you're feeling particularly clever as well, um, you know, you can potentially you know, do some automation behind the scenes using Flow or something else so that when maybe a time off request is put in through your HR system, it then goes in and updates PSA automatically. Again, you know, that is you know, potentially possible what to do. OK, so just conscious of time, so we're just going to keep things rolling onwards then. So we, we talked about our resources then. OK, so we've got our resources built out then. So now we need to think about um, how we can charge them out. And price list is our mechanism for doing this. This is, again, something else that we've inherited in from the sales module. Uh, it's got some additional properties that you need to give some consideration towards. So, for example, context, you need to decide in terms of, OK, is your price list containing just your cost prices? Um, you know, what it costs you to deliver this resource to, you know, to salary and things like that. Is it, you know, your sales price list, what you're going to be charging your customers? There's a whole load of additional things around in terms of, OK, um, markups, expense categories, territory relationships, things like that. Um, so really what you want to be doing is making going through some of the steps that we've done already, uh, minus organisation units, which admittedly we haven't touched upon yet, but making sure you've done the work setting those up first before you start thinking about your price list for the first time. So as an example on here, cost price list. Um, some, some of this should look fairly familiar if you've been working with the sales module for any length of time. Um, so we've just gone on here, we defined a couple of role prices for this um, and some category prices as well for our various transactions and things like that. Again, let's jump in quickly back into PSA now and we'll just build out a very simple cost price list. So we go into sales, sales over here. Uh, navigate down to our price list at the top up here and click on new. We call this our cost price list. So we'll call this uh, 2020 to 2021 uh, cost price list. Uh, we want to affect it from June going up to June 2021. These two settings here are really important. Um, if you have once you've saved the record, you can't change this. So make sure you make the right choice here uh, because we're dealing in Poundstone anyway by standard. We're just going to leave that as default. But at this point, I can save the record. You can see those fields are locked now. And now we can go in and start adding the role prices for the re for the roles that we've defined already. So, for example, for our Dynamics 365 developer, I can say, OK, um, for this for this role in this organization unit, uh, I want to be charging, let's say, uh, I don't know, 85 pounds an hour for this particular one based on this unit. So save and close that. Uh, do again for the second role. So again, we want to maybe just charge this up a little bit higher. Uh, solution architects always bring in the big books, I think. So therefore, 100 pounds. So again, just go through each resource, just define that manually for each one you need. Um, role price markups are useful for when you want to maybe um, you know, automate the ability to be able to do you know, percentage or fixed amount markups on the prices you already defined on here. It's not something we're going to get time to cover as part of today's session. Uh, I have blogged about this previously, um, so uh, um, how you can get this working. So feel free to check that out. And if you've got any questions on that, just let me know after the session. But what we are going to do here is just set up a couple of transaction categories for our expenses. So we're going to do travel in this case. And we're just going to do for this one a price per unit. So we're just going to we're just going to say assume this is let's say mileage per mile. So we're just going to say let's say 0.75 per mile. Let's say we want to charge for that. Okay, so that's pretty much it for priceless then. So let's steam on ahead. So next then, organization units. So we touched upon this already um, a few different times, um, sort of left it towards the end. Uh, you, you may, it may be that you want to bring it forward and set it up a bit more earlier, particularly if, you, if you're 
want to avoid having to go into resources and updates. And it really just depends in terms of how you want to model things. So the key thing to say with this is that these are not the same as business units. They're separate, completely separate. They work in a similar kind of basis in terms of defining distinct subsets of your organization where resources can basically existing. Um, so, for example, you could have, let's say, a UK division, a France division, a uh, you know North America division, etc. Uh, but they're not the same. They don't enforce security and they're not hierarchical in nature. Uh, but what they allow you to do is to basically have different um, price lists, different sales price lists, cost price lists, um, you know, across the organization, across different geographies, potentially. Um, the key thing to remember, though, with resources is that you can only tag a resource into one organizational unit. OK, um, so don't be thinking that you can, you know, basically have cross visual stuff in that situation. You'd have to set up a brand new resource. So maybe have a duplicate. So if, for example, for me, if I wanted to be in the US one in a, re in a US North America organization unit, I'd have to be set up as a second resource potentially. Just keep that in mind with that. They may or may not be relevant for what you need in PSA. Typically, um, you can probably just get away with the one if it's a fairly small deployment. It really just depends in terms of what your preference is, how you want to be building stuff out. This is something that's up in the uh, settings area of the application, uh, which we'll go in and see in a few minutes. So in this case, we've got one here, which has got our default currency of US dollars and the price that's associated with it. Then finally, the thing that you want to be reviewing is your project parameter record. So again, this is another thing that gets shipped out by default when you set up PSA for the first time. It's just a record in the system that defines lots of different settings. So for example, you know, what is the default organizational unit to, uh, to use when you're creating new records? Um, you know, what type of resource allocation do you want to be using in terms of either central or hybrid when you're booking resources out? Do you want to be using multi-currency pricing? Do you want to be working with custom amount and markup based pricing dimensions so where you're bringing in fields from other entities to factor them in as part of your PSA calculations There's a whole host of things on here that you customize so having a look at this record and just uh, doing a bit more of a deep analysis in terms of what each one is doing is going to certainly help you along so again it's accessed from the settings area of the application um, and what we'll do now is we'll just jump in and just have a very brief look in terms of what some of those settings are so we'll go to settings down here um organization units we can see is accessible down here we can do new and just create it forward if we need to um you're definitely going to want to change that name when you set things up for the first time um it's, it seems to be some sort of date time value with i don't know what else on it and on a postcard if you can decipher that so let's just ignore that for now we're going to jump into our project parameter record so there's only one of these in the system you can't create an, an additional one if you you know so just always make sure you're working in this and we can see on here there's things that we can populate so for example the voice frequency we set up earlier we can define what our default one is on there we can enable multi-currency cost pricing we get a warning in the system when we're doing that so just make sure you understand the implications of enabling that setting we're just going to click cancel on that for now we can change our resource allocation mode if we want to, our default work hour template. So if we have gone in and changed things or set up a brand new work hour template, this is where we would do it. Uh, I'm going to save the record at this point. And then through here as well, we then tag on the price lists that are available across the organization. So the one that we set up earlier, our 2020-2021 cost price list, again, we can tag that onto there. And then here is where you look at the amount based pricing dimensions, markup based pricing dimensions. Again, it's quite a detailed topic that you have to actually go in and do entity customizations to a certain extent to get that enabled. Um, so not something that we're going to be able to cover as part of today's session. Um, again, it's something I have blogged about in terms of how you can get working with it. So for example, how you can work with discount markup percentages and things like that, or resource level markups and things like that. This is basically where you would do it, but we're not going to get a chance to cover it today, unfortunately. Okay, right. So quite keen to get to questions. So let's just uh, round up then. OK, so what we've seen then, you know, in obviously at speed, uh, so appreciate that. We'll get these slides sent out. The video will be available so you can refer back to it if you need to. Uh, so you've done all this. What's next? What do I need to start thinking about next? So in terms of my recommendations, so the sales process is something that you're going to want to start looking at and thinking out, um, taking some time to review how the desired out of the box PSA sales process works. Uh, that's going to be really crucial because there are some important differences when you compare it to your default sales module. So, for example, in terms of how opportunities and quotes work, uh, it's a very different type of process. You would typically have one opportunity throughout your sales lifecycle and multiple quotes that sit underneath that uh, for each project that you're generating. So be sure to go in and 
understand that process and tailor it around to suit your needs accordingly. Understand how orders, for example, orders are known as project contracts in PSA. So you're going to have to spend some time just understanding that. When it comes to your projects, um, give some consideration to your project templates. Um, you know, these can help speed things up. So if you're delivering the same kind of projects frequently, uh, having them templatized means that you can more quickly set them up not having to reinvent the wheel each time. Um, consider the project desktop app. So typically most project managers, if they're using PSA, they may prefer to be using the project desktop app. The great thing about using PSA is that you've got an adding for that. So you can work in project, in project for the desktop and at a click of a button, just update PSA uh, with all of your tasks and resources and things like that. So give some consideration about whether you need to deploy that out, uh, what you're gonna need around that. You also need to think about in terms of how the default project delivery process works. Again, there's a default process in terms of how PSA works. It has some bearing on the sales process. So again, understand that uh, and you know perform the analysis to determine whether you need to start modifying or adjusting that to suit your needs. Then when it comes to resource bookings, uh, consider your booking strategy. So do you want to be having people soft booked out? Um, at all, you know, so where booking is sort of in the calendar, but it's not been confirmed, or do you want to also have have it so that people must always book out specifically, okay, that resource is booked out, nobody else can basically occupy that time. Give some consideration to that. Think about how people are going to be going in and recording their progress towards task projects once they've been set up. Uh, so you can go in Dynamics 365 via the model driven app to do that, but it might be maybe you want to provide a more streamlined option for that. So maybe a Canvas app or something like that. Then finally, make sure you understand in terms of when it comes to your actuals, how they're generated in the system and also how you can override and modify those using journal entries, for example. You know, so it could be that, for example, actually there's some hidden costs maybe after the project's been delivered that you need to retroactively factor in. That's where your journals are going to be coming in and the specific process you have to follow to get those applied in. So I'm not so this list here isn't exhaustive. There's no doubt a lot more that you need to think about. And certainly these sort of topics probably could be devoted to whole sessions in themselves. So if it is something that you are interested in seeing, you think there's going to be uh, useful, then do please drop me a line, let me know, and we'll see if maybe we can put together something like a video or a future session at a, you know, say I'm Saturday event or UG or something just to go through those in detail. So before we jump into questions then, I just wanted to signpost some really great resources to help get you started out. Although I have slated the documentation to a certain extent already, um, certainly in terms of figuring a lot of this stuff out. The docs resources, you know, is a go to destination. The key thing, just remember that you always make sure you're viewing the version three version of the documents, uh, dis discard or take anything that references version two with a pinch of salt because it might just be slightly out of date. Uh, this probably goes without saying, but Auntie's blog and YouTube channel are absolute go to reading, go to reading, watching when it comes to PSA. Um, really, it, the content there will really help you along, deals with, you know, edge cases or specific scenarios involving PSA. So if you're not following those or watching those at the moment, then do please check them out. There's been a really good course that uh, Gudeep Kupta, who was speaking earlier, has released, uh, Get It Started with Dynamics 365 PSA version 3. This is a completely free course that takes you through some of this, you know, how to get started in the application, touching upon some of the things that we looked at today. So be sure to check that out. And finally, give some consideration to the roadmap. Have a look at what Microsoft are doing with project operations, what's going to be happening later on this year with the public preview. Um, you know, get some visibility now in terms of what's happening and get yourself prepared. As I say, as I've said before, if you're on PSA version three, then you're in a good position. You're going to be you're going to be handholding and you're going to be able to transition across to um, transition across to the new version when it comes out. Um, but just obviously keep appraised and definitely watch out for the public preview that's coming out later on this year. OK, so all that leaves me to say is thank you very much for attending the session. Um, now would be a really great time for questions. I think we've got about uh, five minutes or a couple of minutes, have we, Raz? For Indeed, yes, you do have, Joe. And uh, thanks again uh, for covering a very comprehensive session uh, for all those who need to get familiar with uh, the configurations of PSA in order to be able to use it. So it's a very, very important session. Without this configuration, you cannot use PSA. So it's a very important uh, it's a very important role in in, in, the, in your journey towards uh, project service automation. So once again, thanks again. A lot of dependencies you've addressed there. Um, and you also, interestingly enough, you actually showed implement them step by step rather than configuring everything all in one go. You actually 
I configured it a little bit and then and then showed it working and moved on to the next. So that that was quite good to see. Um, but yes, so, so please, everybody, can you please um, start asking your questions? I know there's one question there related to um, define um, day as a base unit. Um, that's that's one question. Yes. Um, like yeah. So I think uh, it's actually in there as a default one at the moment, actually. So if we go back onto here and open it up, we can see we've got day. PSA defines day as a default unit for you. Um, yeah. Uh, or actually, no, we set that one up, didn't we? So by default, you get hour. Then what you would need to do is then set up your um, day and then derive it from your hours. So whether it's, you know, eight hours or whatever it is type thing. So that's how you would do that. Um, OK, so we've got a question here. Does the organization unit in C equate to the legal entity in F and O? Um, I'm not too sure on that particular one. I'm going to say a no. If there's any other FNO people on the call who can maybe advise on that. Um, I think typically, uh, so when it comes to, I guess, from a legal entity standpoint, um, I guess for organization units are more, how I see them working best is when you're dealing with multiple geographies or maybe dealing, or maybe let's say you've got a group and you've got maybe subsidiaries underneath that where you know, you've know you got you know, specific employees or individuals underneath that. Um, so in which case, it's probably useful for you to then look at it when you when you're dealing in those circumstances. In most other cases, having just the one organizational unit, you know, so if you're a, you know, like a 50 to 100 person organization delivering just work in the UK with UK based resources, then just a single organization unit is probably going to suit your needs, I think. I hope that's uh, hope that's helped. Um, add to the question. Yep, yeah, um, and in fact, uh, the man to answer that question is actually next up. So uh, please ah, uh, stay in line, uh, Manso. Um, stay online. In the next four minutes, uh, the man himself, Scott Lafant, will be able to help address that challenge. There is one more question here. Um, it's by uh, Mlo, which is, uh, can you walk through the settings, setting up the non-chargeable transaction type? Can it be applied to certain tasks? Um, can it be applied to certain tasks in the project? It would be non-chargeable transaction types would be applied based on either the resource or the expense category. So typically what you would, so in terms of setup, uh, we'll just quickly just show you that again. Um, so we just go into our transaction category up here. Um, so this is for your expense items. This is where you would define that. So you just go non-chargeable up there. Uh, if you're dealing, wanting to have resources as non-chargeable, uh, so again, you would go into your um, your roles, let's say. So for example, go back into Dynamics 365 Developer. And again, it's bidding type on there that dictates that. So when it comes to uh, applying it at task level, um, how you would go about doing that is making sure you're aligning your tasks to a non-chargeable resource. And then in terms of the expenses they're submitting, again, non-chargeable, align it to that. Thanks again, Joe, and thanks again for sharing all the expertise. You cover a lot of different topics, and I know you've you've actually done you've spoken at lots of events, uh, especially a lot of three six five Saturday events. Um, so I want to thank you once again for all the contributions you do for the community. You do cover a lot of stuff across the Microsoft stack. Um, so I just want to uh, make sure everyone to please, please, please follow Joe um, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, um, follow his blog, um, and. Um, Yes, 